inspiration. In the literal sense of the word, to be open to the spirit of creative thinking and sharing your ideas. While we're being mindful, we can be mindful of the fact that the yoga sits on Kalafuya Ili, the traditional homeland of the Kalafuya peoples, of the many possibilities of act for action that this acknowledgement calls us to, I'll offer two a reminder to participate in the 55th Mother's Day powwow being held on May 12th through the 14th at the Garth Court. The event's free and folks welcome. Everyone is welcome. You can also financially contribute to the Northwest Indian Language Institute, that's nili.uorgan.edu, which offers scholarships to native students to learn local indigenous languages. And now to our discussants. Dr. Jessica Swanson Baker is assistant professor of the Department of Music at the University of Chicago, trained as ethnomusicologist at the University of Pennsylvania. She's written articles such as Black Like Me for the journal Ethnomusicology and Sugar Sound and Speed for the journal Representations. Her current book project is Island Time and the inspiration of the title of <laughs> Speed and the Archipelago of St. Kitts and Nevis is under contract with the University of Chicago Press. Anna Mami Lara is a performance artist, poet, and interdisciplinary scholar who is fascinated by ideas of time and place as they relate to the ways people identify and challenge the structures of power and agency. She is an associate professor affiliated with women, gender, and sexuality studies, Latinx studies, and anthropology. Her latest book, yeah, I think that right, the Street, the Street Walking. That's the latest one. We're gonna have one now already because she's still in. Very simultaneous. Queer freedom life. Okay, okay, at the same time. Yeah. But Streetwalking at least received an honorable mention for Isis White Biblical Prize for the Latin American Studies Association. Please let us welcome and thank Dr. Baker and Todd. So we'll start off with the opening salvo from 
both of the doctors a little bit of five minute presentation here and then we'll start inviting questions and getting into the thick of the discussion. Awesome. Okay, well thank you so much for having me. Thanks for this invitation. It's really a pleasure to be here on this beautiful day. I hear this is unusual maybe <laughs> because it's so um, thanks for sharing this side with me. Um, I just want to read maybe a page or two from the book that I need to submit on Sunday um, that has been swirling uh, in my head for about a decade um, where I'm really trying to think about the archipelago and speed as related concepts and it feels as difficult as I think these sounds. Um, and so I'm doing this from St. Kitts and Nevis, which are two tiny islands, but one island, but a two island nation in the Eastern Caribbean. Um, and it's from here that I spent the last several years thinking about speed as an inescapable reality of our contemporary worlds. And I do this as an ethnologist steeped in the intellectual tradition of the Caribbean. And I'm particularly invested in thinking about speed in relation to Caribbean post-colonial modernity and not modernity as a sociological concept, but instead following folks like Aaron Kamadisha and David Scott. I think modernity and its polar corollary tradition as discursive tropes constituted by a differentiated field of discourse. And so this is a field that includes relevant post-colonial concepts, of progress and development. Um, and I'm thinking that investigations of these can give insight into the global network of power and knowledge in which these tropes are employed and the kinds of identities they serve to fashion, particularly one of fashion and identity, whether it be on their LinkedIn or Facebook or um, just within the regular world, especially in a small island, is really important to your ability to have material things. Um, and so this first book project, Island Time, Speed and the Archipelago, from St. Kitts and Nevis, I argue that post-colonial youth of the Leeward Islands aestheticize polysemic notions of speed sonically, visually, and topically, to articulate their social and political presence as contemporary, modern, black youth from an archipelago of archipelagos. Because again, they're from these two tiny islands that are one nation, but also in the archipelago of the Eastern Caribbean, they imagine themselves as part of a small island archipelago that includes like discontinuous islands, but as long as it's small, sort of pejorative, like, um, you know, we're the small guy idea. But then also thinking of the Americas, of course, as its own archipelago, which I think is an idea that's not necessarily as prevalent, um, but certainly I think is part of their imaginary. So after independence from Britain in 1983, which is relatively late when we're thinking about whatever I don't know, you know about postcolonial movements or what you're thinking, but we may technically think about like the late 50s and the early 60s. Um, but uh, in 1983, while American neoliberal economic policies of the 80s and 90s Guaranteed that small places like St. Kitts and Nevis would always be low in the hierarchy of nations and behind, according to the teleology of development. Music technologies of the era, drum machines and MIDI synthesizers and later digital production software, provided the material conditions for musicians and youthful lay producers to imagine and sonically recognize themselves as active participants in the world's accelerations. And one iteration of what that sounds like is a style of soca called Wilders, Wilders, and in St. Kitts and Nevis, or PEP, like, like PEP rally. Um, its speed has been cited by government officials, older musicians, and some cosmopolitan youth as indicative of developmental failures of the post colonial nation. Uh, up until very recently, in the last maybe five or six years or so, this music was considered wholly derivative, backward, and indicative not only of a diminished musical capacity as compared to a previous generation who tamed the steel plan to play Chopin, but also as a product of decolonial nationalism's failure to provide the sign corollary of a foundational myth, which is to say that like the nation, when they were like, okay, it's 1983, we have a nation, we have a national anthem, but nobody said, this is our music, in the way that, for example, Trinidad in receiving independence in 1962, they're like, Calypso is ours. We made this, we own it, and anyone else is doing it, they're stealing from us, you know? Um, which is not so true, actually, but, um, but that's part of the national myth. And in St. Kitts and Nevis, nobody did that, um, and they said that it's a failure of decolonization. Um, okay, so many of these critiques have been tethered to temporal norms locally constituted temporal thresholds or limits that posit Weiler's PEP and its adherent sign and bodily practices as too fast. 
the mode of acquiring instruments and digital sound files quickly, the sexually exquisite lyrics and the women who danced with and inspired them, the collapsing of spaces of practice and spaces of performance, the breakneck pace at which ideas are sampled, borrowed, localized, parody, and recycled from everywhere and turned into material for violence. All these behaviors, these music and practices, push up against boundaries of normative temporality in different registers. Um, So these instances of speed attested to by the internet, too fast or fast fast, uh, constitute, I suggest, a deviation from a projected path. That's how I'm defining speed, is that it's not really something that, uh, an attribute that any one thing can have, that it is really a measurement of a relationship. Um, and so I see speed as, it's a subjective attestation to the fact that you've experienced a, a deviation from a projection and really nothing else. It's not like wholly subjective. Um, and so where these projections emanate from various axes of power, like gender, sexuality, race, and class, via colonial and neocolonial discourses of respectability um, and development and professionalism. And so one particularly salient uh, form of categorization I describe in the book is continentality, uh, where I say that, uh, which is a way of understanding the world that ascribes supremacy to large, contiguous bodies of land. And it's the same conceptualization that passes islands as remote, far away, isolated utopias that are outside of time. And I think with the island geography and island time and temporally marked colonial discourses like development and the idea of fast girls and women, um, to think about what contemporary acceleration, uh, how contemporary acceleration can be thought differently from a small island space. For people who feel like they're outside of history, are not written into history, are not necessarily put on maps all the time. That's a favorite pastime of my parents who are from St. Kitts and Nevis. They kind of like, you know, they pass a map, they'll just like see if St. Kitts and Nevis are on there. And sometimes it's not, you know, <laughs> because it's, it's small. And, you know, and I think that there is a kind of mentality, this idea of the world, the conceptualization that comes with literally having your place of birth be invisible on a world map. Um, but I think that that, I'm arguing this, I think there's sort of an interesting way of conceptualizing the world and time from that kind of space. So that's, well, those are <laughs> some of the things that I've been thinking about. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I always want to have it working. Could you go like? Yes. Oh, the ups, uh, mics are not, are not working. Oh, it's just for the online. Thank you. Can you hear me now? <laughs> show y'all some of my little words for not today. All right. Um, thank you so much, Jessica. Uh, I'm just going to jump in. I actually wanted almost to do a wordplay with you. Can I just like, yeah, okay. throw out some words and see what you say? Sure. Why did you say you get to say with that? Okay. okay. You can throw back some words to you. Yeah, sure. Okay. Do um, I need like two? Do you think? Okay. I'm sorry. Oh, that's right. Because we're doing that. Thank you. Okay. Hi. Did you switch the switch? Uh, is there any? There it is. Okay. okay. All right. So, um, yeah, I was thinking about so many things as you were talking and just making some connections. But um, the first one I wanted to kind of invite into the space is the word bodies. Let's see what you think. <laughs> I mean, we've been thinking of bodies of water. <clears throat> it's one of the ideas that I'm interested in with archipelagic thought. Um, and I was part of an archipelago seminar at Rutgers several years ago. It really kind of changed my life. It really kind of blew my mind open in a way. But bodies of water, um, where an archipelago can be thought of um, as uh, a sea of islands as opposed to islands in the sea. It's sort of these like, kind of so the sort of flipping of an idea that brings together, brings up to the fore a different kind of collective that I'm interested in. But then also bodies, uh, as I'm, I'm really trying to think about how we can take seriously, I was talking about this, uh, how can we take seriously the idea uh, that what the relationship that bodies have to sound is, is a real one, and one that maybe is not necessarily translatable, even though we can try, that there's, not, there's no amount of cognitive science 
um, or music theory, or different kind of notation, or sociology, uh, or even ethnography that can really, I think, fully apprehend the reality of what it feels to be compelled to move uh, by bass or rhythm, or to be compelled to sing along with something that you know. You know. Um, so when, um, specifically when you're talking about um, the speed, the idea of speed and sound recognition, that's when the word bodies came to me, right? And I mean, I love that this is exactly what you're speaking to. Um, when I think about bodies in the context of time, I really, uh, I make a lot of reference to the idea of transmogrification, right? And the idea, I mean, uh, you know, for example, presenting that to the Butler's Wild Sea, right? Of like, the figures of Doro and um, and what were these two, you know, infinite beings that can transform shape in different ways. One is through possession and assimilation, and the other one is through transmogrification. Um, and I always think about bodies in the Caribbean being such a um, a site of required stillness, required containment, right? Like what you're talking about about respectability politics in particular. Who gets to move their hand this way, who gets to sashay that way, who gets to dance in a while, right? And I think about dance hall, um, dance hall in Jamaica, which, you know, is a, is a whole other thing, but, you know, we, there are some similar vocabularies happening in the body in, re in response to dance hall music that you see replicated in Jay setting in the South, that you see replicated in Denbo and Haiti in the Dominican Republic. And so that's, you know, when you're talking about sound recognition, for me, a lot of times when I'm looking at questions of time, corporeality, I'm seeing what's, what's happening in the body with these different rhythms, these different, these different landscapes and geographies, um, these different waters, um, and then how does that then, um, how does that then challenge the seeming total narrative of the Christian colonial body? Um, so that's uh, you could do you could do the second one, but <laughs> um, I'm going to read a little bit about my concept on ubiquitous time. This is actually a paper um, I wrote, an article I wrote about the work of Sharon Bridgeforth, um, who is an African American playwright uh, from Louisiana, currently lives in California, worked many years in Texas, and I had the opportunity to apprentice with her and Omi Oshun Jamil Jones working in theater as a jazz aesthetic, um, learning about applying the principles of jazz to theater work. Um, and uh, Sharon is the author of uh, Love Conjure Blues, um, uh, Blood Signs, right, and uh, quite a few other, I'm saying Blood Signs is not too popular, um, Blood and Kin, and um, she is a very, very prolific playwright. She has that black mermaid lady, a uh, man lady, right, that's the current piece she's been working on. Um, and so this is an excerpt from the Ponder Blues. Um, and when I talk about the Ponder Blues this time, the subheading says, ask your question, child, locating the origins of memory. I remember I born, I remember I born, I remember I born, I remember I born, I remember drinking with the moon, I remember jumping in the water, I remember hiding in the trees, I remember hanging in the town, in the sun, I remember gold and shadow, I remember glitter and smoke, I remember I, I, I. Thus spoke the girl as she comes into the world. These are the first words that fill the space of the stage, the repetitive utterance that calls the audience into being and remembering our own birth as individuals and as peoples. For Bridgeforth, it is this point of departure, the memory and the remembering, or the remembering, that allows for the act of birth to occur. It is in this remembering that, uh, um, that allowed Bridgeforth's own journey across the Atlantic to Nigeria in 2006 to initiate the process by which Delta Dandy would be born. And when I asked Bridgeforth what she remembered from her trip to Nigeria, she said, quote, crossing the Atlantic, it was like once you leave home, you can't go back. The unromanticized truth is that that was not my homeland. I wasn't received. I can't go back. At the same time, homeland is my blood. When I went to Nigeria, everything I knew in my blood and memory was affirmed. The interview I, I conducted with Sharon Bridgeford for took place three years after her journey to Nigeria. And only then was it even possible for Bridgeford to fully discuss the intricacies and challenges of her experience and to reflect on the integration of her experience into her work. 
The creative processes of an affective shifts occurring within those interstitial spaces form the foundational articulations of an aesthetic and practice that reside in between the beats of memory, a syncopated making and remaking of the self. For the purposes, so that for Bridgeworth, memory is a psychic and physical material which courses through her blood, which in turn is affirmed by her sense of place. It is an elusive marking that extends beyond her immediate lifetime to many lifetimes throughout the ubiquitous time into the world of the ancestors, spirits, and those who are waiting to be born. When she speaks of what shifted for her as a result of going to Nigeria, she says, the ways that I understood the ritual of our lives and the ritual of how we do community, of how we praise people on this side, everything that I understood about my impulses as, as an artist was all affirmed there. Her bridge forth the memory of her people, both those from whom she came and those she knows back home in the southern Mississippi Delta, was also affirmed. This was a memory that was lived in the practice of recalling and manifesting her effective relationships between those who were in America, as she herself was in Africa, remembering those who were forced from Africa, who were her home in the Americas, the fact of her body in Nigeria brought people that are historically and geographically distant into both the central and material proximity through the acts of recollection and ritual. Uh, Love Honey Blues and, and Delta Dandy are delicately shaped by that experience in both their groundings and the notion of remembering, as well as in their uses of a timeless memory based on ubiquitous time. And so, you know, this idea of ubiquitous time also reappears when I'm thinking about queer bodies and the context of the Caribbean. And the idea that contrary to Jose Esteban Munoz's and Nadia Alex's theorization, Jose Esteban Munoz is right talking about queerness is always on the horizon, and Nadia Ellis reinstating um, black diaspora is always on the horizon. Um, what I found interesting in my research, both with LGBTQ activists and queer ceremonialists um, and other tradition keepers in, in the Caribbean, is that actually the way people articulate a time, I would, I would ask people, where are we? And they'd say, estamos aquí, we're here. Right, and so this idea of the here, this ever-present here, challenges the idea of blackness and queerness is always there, away from us, distant from us, shaped by it. A, a kind of a, a temporal becoming and, and, um, and re identification. And I found that to be a profound contrast, <laughs> right, um, to what I had learned to think about as the horizon of queerness, or the horizon of black diaspora, of the always becoming. Um, and maybe, you know, there's a linguistic component in the idea of the Spanish, of the word aquí, you know, that, that makes it very specific. And so when I would ask a spatial question, where are we? The question of response is temporal, right? We are here in this time, aquí in this moment. Um, and so that confounds both the horizon and also the idea that the body is, um, that the body is finite, right? Because the here contains that ubiquitousness. I'll stop there. If you want to remember where I'm going, I'll refer to it. Can you say more? I want to hear you say more about the in-between the piece of memory. I mean, obviously, I mean, it's a new poem, and it's beautiful, you know, and it's sort of, before it means anything, it feels like something, mm -hmm. but I'd love to hear more about, yeah, how you think about that. Mm -hmm. um, I think, and when talking specifically about Sharon Bridgeworth's, I, you know, articulation of memory is something that blood, right, in the blood, but also uh, in between those beats. Um, what I understood from what she was saying, and what I have understood in the context of looking at traditional, or, you know, working with traditional musicians, um, Paleros, Atabales, Congo, and Juan Atabales, and the Dominican Republic, um, is that uh, the story happens in between the beats, right? And so it happens in the intangible moment. So, for example, a common experience with Sharon's work is that people will go into the theater space and everyone will be completely focused on what's happening on the stage. And you ask people afterwards what happened and nobody can tell you. Because they were just completely there in between the beats. It's intangible. It's, it's, it's what happens between us that we, we don't know. We don't know how far this is between us. 
right? And so, like, I think that what that's what she's alluding to, Sharon Bridgeworth, when she talks about you know, the what emerges in between the beats. Um, and I've taken that to to be a reference also to the ways in which even performance, um, you know, the embodied experience means that we may not always have language for what we're experiencing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That makes me think of something that I'm after in my work is how to account for the stuff in between the beats. Even the idea of the beat, like when we're thinking about um, like 90s musical notation, or like the new thing in 90s musical notation, I think. I mean, is there theorists here who think better at this than I think? So it seemed at one point, there's a point where folks are trying to find a way to notate like the subdivisions of these that we feel that can't actually be notated by, let's say, a quarter, right? And then so then we just kind of like write a quarter note and we draw some lines, right? And then we draw some smaller notes and then we draw more lines and we end up with something that's like a triangle, like a seagull graph. That's a thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's, and, a it's a complicated thing. Yeah, but it seems to me that that was kind of, I won't say fail, but it was an attempt to get at um, something that sort of seemed like a new idea in the 90s, the idea that there was more than what could be written. And so the idea that this is, that the thing in between the beat is in fact the substance of the thing um, is really beautiful. It's really beautiful and is, I think, gets at a sort of reality that kind of coalesces what like academia and all of our smart kind of flighty ideas and the kind of bodily stuff that has been pushed out of academia for a long time. And it's fun, it's going to be interesting to see how all these ideas are really trying to get at a similar kind of inexplicable idea. <laughs> uh, something that we know is real in our bodies that a lot of people can talk about as being true, but it's just really elusive for any of the forms of notation or writing or categorization that we actually have. You should ask um, one of the musicologists in the room about microtiming, by the way, because this person knows more about microtiming than, than I do as a theorist. <laughs> well, no, I, mean, I was going back actually to something that, that Ed Wolf and I did, which was um, some Vata drum. Yeah. That is really hard because there's so much going on in between the spaces that I think of as the beat or the pulse in a music. It's so rich in terms of all the temporal locations in multi drum, multi headed drum Vata music that for me that is, that is music that has so much going on. Between the beats. Mm -hmm. And you, you, need those, you need those spaces for the syncopation, the polyrhythmic. I, I don't know this little theory terminology, so please forgive me for my layman's terms, but you know, just uh, that, poly, that polyrhythmic um, expression, right? And to sing in the context of those drums requires a really embodied understanding of the rhythm because you have you can hit the, you can hit the beat of one drum but not the other. So, um, but in any case, uh, yeah, I, mean, I think you're right. I think that there's a way in which um, so many of us are thinking about what happens in that in between space. Maybe for me, it, it's related to the unmooring of colonial categories, you know, and the unfixing of colonial categories, or even the ways in which colonialism seeks to fix everything. Like, I mean. You know, again, in theater, like, what I learned in, in jazz aesthetic theater is that, you know, I had to be a, virtu a virtuos a virtuous instrument, right? Have virtuosity in the instrument. And that spontaneity is expected. But that spontaneity requires that deep listening, right? And so, to even be able to uh, engage with other people on the stage through language as opposed to through instrumentation, right? like, through language, required an understanding of that in between space. And you're right. It's, but I don't think I don't think Sharon would try to fix it. Well, from what I know of her, she's you know. But I also I kind of you know part of me resists the fixing of that for sure, or or a, or a, a sort of layer of transparency around that, mm -hmm. even as we try to, to define it <laughs> or to talk about it, to talk about it, or to actually like even validate its existence. <laughs> yeah, which is I think. Maybe going too far, but like that's sort of the hard part of 
language <laughs> in, in general. So sort of fixing necessary um, that is already doing something different than the actual thing that we're talking about. Mm. Um, mm. Yeah, I am. Um, so with career freedom by sovereignty, I experimented with the idea of speculative and anthropology um, and using the modal form in English. So not a single argument in that book is made through an in paired form. Um, everything is open as may, could, could be, possibly. Which is actually a form that in Spanish is known as a subjective and actually opens up possibility for new ideas to emerge. It's an in-between way. It's a what I call a woven dense way, right? A woven density um, that allows us to imagine I do want to hear about micro timing, but, but, but before I want to just respond to the idea of the speculative and subjunctive to say that an important part of the book that I'm trying to finish so desperately is, is also a sort of subjunctive that I think, again, opens up um, the possibility of talking about two really paradoxical worlds at the same time. And I, I talk about uh, my grandmother, who in the Caribbean there are lots of like, non Christian religions. Obviously, one of them being like Obia or Guru. And in St. Nevis, which is a like, highly anglicized, um, Episcopalian uh, society, uh, the idea would be my grandmother, where older people would say, if I would have believed in Obia, <laughs> I would say <laughs> that somebody put a hex on me, that somebody, you know. <laughs> That is the way. And so it's like, you know, to say that we don't believe, but if I did, I could even, yeah. <laughs> and that's sort of this different kind of tense of, of, you know, of recognizing what is possible while also performing its impossibility, which I think is such an interesting way of writing, mean, especially being a woman in the middle of that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, tell us about my clothes. <laughs> I mean, uh, the microtiming I've studied is in hip hop music, which is done like you mentioned, DAWs and drum machines. Um, so it's it's music that's made with um, sort of a, a grid, right, with a beat, a pulse, and then you can put, you can move uh, sound events around that pulse. You can sort of move them continuously so that it strikes just that a, a fraction of a second later or earlier than. The pulse, or you can have it strike right, right on the pulse and anywhere sort of around. And so, producers um, starting in the 1990s, um, and, and my areas with Jay Dilla, especially from Detroit, um, started experimenting with placing different sound events um, in relationship to, to like an overall pulse in, in new ways that were not, that were hard to understand as like on a traditional grid or um, within a traditional sort of a framework we could write as being part of a quarter note and an eighth note and a sixteenth note and putting them in, in different divisions of that beat. And so that's that's micro time as I sort of understand this idea. And I'm curious how the pep sounds actually. I wish I could I wish, I wish, I'm sorry that I'm not going to this right now. So um come sound come up with this. <laughs> yeah um when you were talking, I was thinking, I mean, honestly, Dilla, I, I'm glad you mentioned that. I was thinking of, of Dilla, but it seems to me that that's also kind of the basic definition that we have of what groove is constituted by, is, is micro timings and like a little bit off, and that is what creates a sweet spot. My favorite definition of groove, I think, actually goes back to this idea of in between the beats, and um, why am I thinking this? Oh, it's, uh, it's Fred Noble who says that. Uh, Groove is what happens when music becomes something other than itself. Um, and it seems to me that that is trying to really grasp that the thing in between the beat or like, um, um, you know, things like us. Yeah, the thing is like what other than, you know, what, what's happening um, um, otherwise. But the idea of micro timing is still, of course, an idea that if we can just get a smaller and smaller unit, it's like another idea of the scheme graph, <laughs> into the scheme graph. <laughs> but like the scheme you know, right? if we can just isolate smaller and smaller, if we can talk about smaller and smaller units, then maybe we'll get at the reality. And that's something about this moment, I think, that we're encompassing this attractive present that we're encompassing. Um, it seems that even the measurements of the super tiny are still not actually apprehending what we're experiencing. It's still not actually getting at our reality. It seems that like the, the, the terms that we have to talk about the present 
are no longer cutting it in a way that I think people more than ever are recognizing. Things are moving faster than we actually have like, like metrics for. We think about like, the stock market happening now at a pace that we can't really account for. Or thinking about things, my favorite example is the idea of permafrost as this permanent frozen layer that's now melting, you know, and so that we just don't know how to talk about it in a way. Um, and so some stuff is for me in some way that I don't think I'll be able to articulate right now. These ideas about like in between the beat or the groove that seemed sort of like, you know, you're not, not scientific are, I think, really the only metrics that we have to go on at this point to be able to talk to each other about what it is that we're experiencing. Um, and that's sort of kind of what I'm trying to get at uh, in, in the book in my larger project. Although I'm finding that just really hard again to write about because, you know, I'm thinking that what's happening between lines is really where it's at as opposed to anything that I can quote in the book. So. Can, I, can I ask you if you, um, what you think about opacity as a theoretical tool? Um, I mean, have you thought about it? Have you engaged it? Do you discard it? <laughs> Is it something that doesn't prove to be useful? So, I mean, what, my understanding of opacity. Using the science definition. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, right. So, as someone who thinks about the article, thinking about that, why the science work is sort of essential. I think of opacity kind of as a political project when I think about Poussaint, um, and I'm not with it, you know, as a, as a personal project. I don't know if we're all familiar with Poussaint, but generally I think this idea of opacity is, is that his writing and his work, and he thinks other kinds of work, does not have to be clear. It doesn't necessarily have to be um, readily apparent uh, or definable. Um, because that, in a way, mirrors the reality of anything that it could be possibly trying to explain. Would you say that that's true? Oh, yeah. I mean, I agree. And he's, yeah, he's specifically talking about writing. Right. The theorization. Right. The theorization can be hard and not, you know, easily apprehensible. And I think that he can do that. He was able to do that for particular reasons as, like, you know, as a man, as a French theorist, as so, uh, um, and also as a poet. Um, I don't feel really beholden to that as a project, um, especially because I do want to be in conversation with people, um, and, I, and because I'm part of the other politics of my work is that we can think with like regular, regular music, we can think with regular people as an ethnographer, and I just talk to a regular person that, that they're already theorizing um, in, in ways that actually connect to the community. Um, But on the other hand, it does as someone who's also interested in thinking with black girls or minoritized people. I, you know, invested in the idea that there are people theorizing and writing and saying things that are really meaningful and powerful that don't or can't make sense within a kind of hegemonic discourse. Um, and that there, that that opacity uh, is a useful one, not because of the idea of maybe uh, translating what it is they're trying to say or getting at. Would, would there be? It's not lossless. There would be something lost uh, to it. So maybe opacity is a right that everyone has, even though it's like not my particular thing. <laughs> Um, no, I mean, I, I bring it to the table as, I mean, as you were talking, and you were talking about the teens, your parents, I love that phrase, by the way. Um, <laughs> and uh, you were talking about, um, you know, the idea of too slow or too fast, um, and a measure of relationship. I think about what uh, Sierra and Sorton has done with uh, Hassan's idea of opacity, talking uh, about it as a space of, of you know, both a post-subjective uh, possibility for um, trans ontologies, black trans ontologies, um, that the power comes in the not knowing, right? The power comes in the in in the kind of dense layering, right? The fugitivity that occurs and emerges out of the dense layering, um, and um, in particular as a counter impulse to progress. So that's why I wanted to bring it to the table. Um, because 
the, the ways in which Smartin uses it, and I also um, I also mobilize it as a way to also talk about like uh, the preservation of the preservation of Black and queer sovereignty, autonomy, and freedom. So it's an in, it's you know it's it's a little uh, it's a a ciphering <laughs> of this idea, right? Um, and a reappropriation of the idea, um, building on Sorin's work with it, building on the potential, the potential power capacity as a site um, where where the colonial gaze is interrupted uh, consistently over and over again. Um, but also it's transformed. Um, and again, this uh, this uh, flies in the face of much queer theory, right? It flies in the face of um, much black black studies thought in particular, um, you know, people. And so, yeah, I'm going to stop there. I have many ideas running through my head, but um, I'll stop there. Just it's, it's potential to be counter-progressive. Yeah, I want to say more about that. The capacity as a counter-discourse of progress. Yeah, it's really powerful, but I'll have to say more about that, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I, I, I agree with you that, you were, that the sounds rendering of it is painful. <laughs> To modern readers, <laughs> and you know, if you have like, any sort of critical gender analysis, but, um, but I think that there's, there might, I don't know, for me, there seems to be something there um, because, in you know, I think about the city mirrors to use a very colloquial example, which are completely opaque um, until they're held to the sun, and you can actually see the sun through them, right? And so you see everything that's moving through them as an object. That you wouldn't necessarily see if you didn't hold it up to the sun. I'll leave it there. It's an image. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you have questions for <laughs> Well, I was fascinated. I've been thinking because we've been thinking about different layers of time here, and uh, the Mata idea that Sean brought up was kind of interesting to me. And the, the thing that it relates to me in terms of ubiquitous sign and this in between the beats space maybe as an answer to the idea of opacity as well, which is that master drummers, at least in our understanding, have, one of the things that makes polyrhythm work is that you're not really, it's not that you're necessarily would be holding two things at the same time, but that you are aware of the potential to choose a stream at any particular point in time. So just to simplify, for example, I could, I, I'm going to approach this next unit of, of, of rhythm. I can think about it in three, I can think about it in two. Either one is possible, it has a full of potential between the beats right now. But that moment is coming and it has to happen and I make a decision and I'm going to express something in that moment. At which point I define it and the next moment has another potential relationship to it as well. But something has to happen in that particular moment. Now, whether you understand it or not, like it's placed, you know, that that might be another way of thinking about it. But it's those potential spaces between the beats that that you're speaking about, but that also give you the ubiquitous sort of all the possibilities at any one point in time that you can think about during that that space that you're playing in, in this sense of time. Mm -hmm. The thing that it makes me think about, however, is in relation to your work, Jessica, is that. Oh, we're talking about all this wonderful potential space of doing things in between the beats. And as someone who is a percussionist, just like where the beat has always been such a positive thing to me, hearing this particular thing makes me feel like the beats are kind of like closing the end here. Like, I, I don't have this potential. And then what does that mean when speed hits it? And as my, my way I've been traditionally thought to think about it, the, the amount of space between the beats now all of a sudden is really cramped, so I don't have room to do, or it seems to me, and this is where we could be thought, that the amount of space or the amount of time for me to do something or to realize something has actually been more limited or by increasing the time. And yet, we're here, here we are now in St. Kitts and Nevis, and they're saying like, this is our thing, we're gonna make sure this music is like, you don't, you don't get it because the speed is so fast. So, 
thought I'd, I'd throw those out uh, and see what you think. Yeah, I mean, at first I think, yeah, you know? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, one idea that comes to mind is the idea that I think, I don't think this is just in San Diego, I mean, there is a, um, I am weary, I think it's all kind of how there are of, you know, sort of being like, in this magical place, they, you know, time is different, and you know, and, it's, 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 um, and I'm also talking about like my aunts and uncles and my cousins, you know, and so like, that is also something that allows me to get this, regular life people. Um, but I think that because of their ability or inability to think about beliefs that are happening really close together, there's also, I think, a conceptualization of a very zoomed out notion of the beat, of the carnival that happens, happens annually, of, you know, of like seasons of the year, of thinking about time, of thinking about what hurricane season is. And even though that's, you know, an annual thing, you know, there's a space in between the hurricanes that also constitutes, like, a concept of time. There's a cyclical idea to it, um, but pretty much that the idea that the beat is something that can be, you know, we can think about micro-timing, so that we can also, I don't know, macro-timing is not even what I want to say here, but that there's also a zooming out that's possible, um, that I think just allows for a different conception of how we think about uh, recurrence, which is really what the beat is, right? Mm -hmm. The idea that there's something similar recurring, happening again. I mean, I think that's, that, that's an idea that I'm able to get at better or differently with the archipelago. If we think of the archipelago as a string of islands, or just kind of like a consortium of islands, even if they're not necessarily close together. We think of somewhere like Micronesia, Polynesia, there's like literally thousands of, of miles in between some of the islands that are still considered as a unit. Um, that we're seeing a basic unit of similarity that is repeated again and again, though the relationship between each thing is not, is not definable, you know, by any one-to-one -one relation. Does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. um, and so then if we can think about beat as the similarity as a kind of an archipelagic relationship, then it's not necessarily the recurrence of the same thing, but just sort of the recurrence of something that constitutes something that is similar to the thing that happened before. Um, and so that allows, I think, for thinking in different scales, whether we be doing this or the beat of like, you know, natural disasters that's happening every seven years, that I think puts like adds a kind of contour uh, to life that is not as limiting as I think I've maybe seen um, <laughs> that like a colonial discourse is. Beautiful, thank you. A lot there. I hope I'm, there was a lot there. Yeah. It's beautiful. I mean, I loved it. It made me um, wonder, don't get to engage this, but it made me wonder about the intergenerational sense that emerges when wild like music comes up. <laughs> you know, pen music, like what's happening when your aunties and uncles are hearing this music and kids are hearing, children are hearing this music, cousins are hearing this music, the kind of concomitant soundscape that emerges. I think a lot of this project comes out of what was happening at least in the early 2000s when the generation of people who were already adults when independence happened are hearing this new music. I think there's a lot of dreaming about what the nation can be with independence, this idea of what the nation should be and what it needs to compete economically um, and politically within a global context. Um, and the music to them is like, this we failed. Like, we've gone in a bad way. Everything, you know. Does it fail to the second It fails to develop in the way that one should. Fail, you know, I spoke to the man, I interviewed the man who wrote the St. Kitts and Nevis national anthem. He's an um, orchestral musician. Um, and he was like, you know, it surprises me that nobody is writing orchestral music in St. Kitts and Nevis. You know, why is nobody writing for an oboe here? And that is a failure. It's because they don't know about it, because our government has failed to teach them properly. The idea that someone would be using a computer, you know, to make music as opposed to real instruments is because of a lack of awareness, a lack of exposure, um, and that is the government's failure. Um, and I think that the music, I mean, that's not, I, I think that's a typical argument, actually, against you know, like digital or like electronic music, the idea of a real musician, a producer not, it's like lazy, et cetera, et cetera. 
Um, but I think that, that but it was really mapped onto these ideas of both development and respectability um, and proper authorship um, that was, I think, fed to them in a very colonial time, an actual colonial time, uh, when the idea that anyone could take local sounds um, as they were and recognize them as good or meaningful was just like unthinkable. It was just really unthinkable. Um, and so even younger people that I was talking to were still, I think, regurgitating an idea that the music that they loved and secretly listened to was stupid. But again, because there wasn't language to talk about it um, as good. There wasn't language to talk about the way that it would make someone feel. There wasn't language to talk about um, pleasure as useful in a society that is, you know, a, plant, a formal plantation society, a legacy of, of, of child slavery, the idea that a body is useful because it's productive. So where can an idea of pleasure really come into, um, you know, being a good ethical uh, citizen um, when all the discourses about music have been about aesthetics? Like, is it beautiful? Is it high-minded? Is it enlightened? Um, can it be recognized? Could it be played on an opera stage in Paris? Um, I forgot what, what the question that you asked me was. <laughs> but there is a question. <laughs> oh, I was curious about the intergenerational soundscape. Because, I mean, when you talk about you know, aunties, when you talk about like, you know, aunties and uncles and older generations, like, I mean, I have a soundscape that emerges, right? A vocal soundscape that emerges, like, of people reacting to Den Bull or people reacting to Fayette Film in all different kinds of ways, right? And then how that um, replicates itself through instant time on social media, right? Um, but that there is also a, there's also a repeating item in that process. <laughs> you know, um, you have people who reacted to Bachata when it first came out, right? And then you hear the same kind of soundscape with, with reggaeton, and then you hear the same kind of soundscape with Bengo with slight alterations, right? Slight alterations each time having to do with who the bodies are at the center of the music, having to do with the spaces in which the music plays, the, the, the volume in which it plays, the, the means by which it plays, right? the materiality of all of that, um, but then also how it um, unleashes, how, different, how those different genres then also unleash um, concerns, moral panics around respect and respectability, and whether or not the state, the nation state, has been affected by that molding its ideal citizens. So that's, I was, I was just curious, because I was like, is it a similar sense? <laughs> like, you know, when I say this, is there, is there a, a recognition? Is there, you know, what is happening if we were to look and think about well, I think uh, and that's what you're really trying to uh, lead me to think about. You know? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll answer more succinctly this time. But I think uh, there's an older generation, if I can generalize, that cannot or refuses to recognize a sonic correlation between contemporary music and traditional music. So they see it as a break. They see it as a break, as a break, as a loss of tradition and the too much foreign influence as like we've lost everything and that's you know that's why we're single, et cetera, et cetera. But when I'm talking to younger musicians, they see it as an absolute continuation of an older legacy. And they're doing this by thinking mostly about timbre, of thinking about like these sounds, this is the sound that's kind of like the steel pen, this is kind of like uh, the big drum that we dance to, this is kind of like a fife. And I'm hearing really similar things too. But the biggest uh, argument that they're making is that St. Kitts and Nevis has always been fast. The idea of being from a small island, that there was a kind of speediness to it, of like that your resources have to come from other places, um, and that you're always reacting to kind of environmental factors, to things happening that are they're being very, very vulnerable, that there's a speed to that, that they recognize as part of their very lineage. Um, and so it's interesting to, to see how younger people are kind of recasting themselves as part of a history that an older generation is really reticent um, to, to recognize. Do you think there's a lot of anxiety about, uh, about the future of the older generation? Is that, that... Okay. I, think, 
I, I can't answer my own question. That was a really question. And I'm like, what's happening with people that they're worried about the future? But yeah, I think so. I think so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think so. And I, I think that the process of independence as a political thing happening late means that people in St. Kitts and Nevis um, have already seen the failure of independence uh, elsewhere in the Caribbean, and that that makes it even scarier. I think that there's even more sort of fear about what is acceptable. Independence for St. Kitts and Nevis was not the product of like, you know, people in the streets agitating for liberation in that way. It was an inevitability because Britain was getting rid of its colonial dependence. You know, so if you're reading the newspapers in 1979 and 80, folks are scared. There are people protesting that they don't want independence because they see that Jamaica is not looking good. It's not looking that great, you know, in Haiti. It's not looking, you know, independence in Grenada. It's not looking like the thing that, it, that folks were talking about in the 60s, and they're seeing it. It's 20 years of seeing it not really working. So they, I think there's a real fear of of the inevitability of what was to come, of certain kind of failure, of violence, of neoliberal policies, of knowing that there was going to be a McDonald's and a subway on every corner. Um, that wasn't, nobody was like surprised by this idea. It felt like it was coming to them. And then, that feeling, I think, sort of feels like the vibe of at least the news now, mm -hmm. kind of this anticipation, this kind of bracing oneself for um, bad stuff, generally. Um, and I think that that. You know, so then the, the way that folks are, are characterizing music definitely is from a, a feeling of fear, a resentment, in fact, of, of, of a future that is not the one that they necessarily would have chosen if they had the opportunity. Thank you. Yeah, that's question. You kind of, oh, go please. I'm just um, curious, you know, they talk about speed, our ability to communicate gets faster every day, all right? And because of that, you know, people on an isolated island, um, sorry if that's not the right word, but it, because of, I'm just curious on that island, they're able to hear what's going on in the outside the world and be influenced by this much, much greater now than it was, you know, 10 years ago. And I'm wondering um, what you see, what impact that has um, on the music that's being created, created there. Because I, I would assume, you know, 50 years ago or so, there could have been a different sound on the north part of St. Kitts than in the south part of the bigger city than in some rural areas. Mm -hmm. And if that's still the case, or is it more homogenous now because people could communicate so much faster? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not seeing, I don't really have any evidence of like greater homogenization necessarily. And I think part of the argument that I'm trying to make, based on what I think I'm understanding people to be telling me, is that being on a small island or living, surviving, thriving on a small island means that you're always thinking archaeologically anyway. You know, that like obviously like the internet and like now they can have different cable channels and WhatsApp doesn't mean that things are happening at a different pace. There's a more, or it's easier to get it. It's mm -hmm. easier to get some. I don't have to wait for somebody to put it in their suitcase. Right. But I was going to get it anyway. You know, it was maybe it was going to two months, 30 years ago. But I was going to get it, you know, and I was waiting for it and it was going to happen. Um, and so I think maybe the biggest thing is the pace, but not necessarily like the aesthetic of things from everywhere being ours. And I had one um, a rapper in St. Kitts tell me, I am entitled to American music. I'm from the Americas. Like, I'm entitled to this. This is mine, too. Which is, I think, kind of a different way. I, mean, I don't know that anybody, you know, I don't know that I would have thought about it that way. Um, but I think that be, being on a small, small island and knowing already that, like, your necessities would need to come from elsewhere, there would have to be an allocation of things from Nevis or, you know, where we when you're going to St. Thomas seasonally to do something, that everything is already happening as part of the consortium anyway, you know? And so it's like, yeah, not a new idea. Okay, answers your question. I think so. Okay. Are there any other questions out there? Where, um, do you have a website, or is there, because I've never heard of music 
Is there a way to, uh, is there a website to be cured or some other way? Yes. I don't know if any of these are related. If it wouldn't come up, then I might, why there's so many things not the best. <laughs> you put it in.
Yeah, I think, I mean, so the main, or at least what I focus on, and like one of the most anticipated things of the year is Carnival. In St. Kitts and this is a Christmas time thing. Um, so Boxing Day, or really like at four o'clock, three or four o'clock in the morning on Boxing Day, is when folks are going outside. This is when bands will have the trucks, and this is Juve in, in St. Kitts and Nevis. Um, and that is a time when typically you're dancing for about eight or nine hours through the street, um, going maybe a mile and a half, two miles, but over eight hours, you know? And so you're moving, you know, and the point is that you're moving, but you're moving, so the movement that's really, in, like, that's really integral to the idea is more vertical and horizontal. It's not, you know, like, so the speed even here is like not useful. It's not a useful metric necessarily for thinking about how much energy is being expended um, mm -hmm. um, in the moment. Um, but definitely there are other things that participate in making it possible that you can dance for eight hours, right? Like there's alcohol, is rum is key to, <laughs> uh, to making the thing go. And it's like it's gonna, it's gonna be a part of any float or you know, like if you're buying a package to be part of a troop. Rum is like for sure included in that. There are a lot of songs that are owed to, to rum, but also just the, the, the beat of it. I think the idea of like creating this drive and the energy of it and the bass shaping your body is something that I think there's a force to it. It's kind of hard to, to describe. Um, but you're also in this space where you're starting, it's dark, and watching the sunrise. It's also this interesting ritual of like playing with time. Um, because you're not being particularly productive, but you're also pushing your body. The idea that um, the, the word work is one that can talk about actual work, but also walk, to, to work, to wind your body, to work it, it's also sex, right? It's the idea of kind of playing in your body with this idea of being productive that just doesn't translate into the other ways that you know work does on a, on a, at a regular time of the year. I think it's something that's really integral to like, the understanding of how people are able to listen to the music um, and think about time with it. I also think that part of what you're talking about is a collapse between the listener and performer. Like, distance. Um, <laughs> that in other words, like, as people are dancing, they become, become part of the performance um, as they are um, play, you know, playing the music, they are listening to what's happening in the audience and weaving it into the spontaneous integration of the music. Every, all of this needs to be like this idea of the hyper cipher. You know, like, um, I, I mean, even just your example, like eight, eight six nine, <laughs> right? That we're all hyper, the hyper cipher. Um, and you know, as a, as a, yeah. Thank you. I don't know what it means, but I, it's just a, a word that came. That's the word. Hyper cipher. So take it's yours. Well, what I think it means is like, you know, um, I mean, I think about the cypher, right? Like the cypher when you talk about what I, when my, in my knowledge is hip hop, you know, um, I come to that as a poet um, and with a brother who's a hip hop artist. And so when I think about the cypher, is that space where possibility is, is always present um, in the meeting, right? And so you have, you have the, you have what came before, right? The beats that came before that are really appropriate. It's like what you're saying, right? In that moment of infinite possibility, it can become something completely different and something else. But the hypercite where I was like, oh, I don't, you know, again, I don't know what this means, but um, just it came out in relationship to what you were talking about uh, it, uh, in terms of speed as a measure of relationship. Um, um, language. <laughs> Out as a, in case it's useful. Um, and, and I think that the, the hyper cipher, right, like the place where we're reinventing through movement, through dance, through interaction between audience, right, the audience performer could like dichotomy just does the whole in the same way. Um, but that's also like a manifestation of, like, of that possibility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I mean, I was thinking about Right, that your question is really led, led me to think about well, um, listening is, in my understanding, and again, I'm not a music theorist, you know, is an intersubjective, right? Inter intersubjective, 
And I just can't imagine music in the Caribbean as something, even classical music. I've been to, you know, I went to, to a classical music concert and I went to a salsa concert in the National Gallery of Art in San Domingo. And everyone is dressed very respectfully. There's a dress code, right? You have to go in. There's just all of this propriety. And the minute the music comes on, people are dancing in the aisles, right? And like they're just sitting and they're interacting with the orchestra, right? Even in moments where they're trying to like, um, embody a sort of uh, Euro-Caribbean civility, which, <laughs> um, you know, it's always like, there's always this moment of failure, right? <laughs> that moment of failure, it, you know, if, depending on the base from which we see it, like, becomes that moment where the truth of the body expresses itself as, as that listening and performative subject, um, or it becomes a moment where, where the body is captured. Be, you know, so that's you know, that's a good question. And if we answer the question, well, there's an answer. <laughs> well, I think we're at the time where we should thank our guests here. If there are no more questions, and uh, there's there's supposed to be cookies and stuff on there. I don't know if it's there. <laughs> Wondering if they forgot. <laughs> oh, there you go. There it is. Okay, so if you need a little sugar, uh, there's going to be some outside appropriately. Um, a little speed on it. There are limits to the beans here that we can provide. But let's give a round of applause, please, for everyone. Thank you.